At the dawn of the internet, before Facebook and Google roamed the land, there was something called America Online. <laughs> the cool kids called it AOL, and it had an email service at a time when receiving emails was novel, and dare I say, delightful. <laughs> it so captured the cultural zeitgeist, Hollywood even made a movie about it. <laughs> AOL was popular for its internet forum where strangers met online in something called chat rooms. There were chat rooms for just about anything. And if I wanted to trash talk about how my chargers had beaten the Raiders, I joined the sports room. Or if I wanted to connect with someone from the local area, there was a separate San Diego room. There was no video or Zoom, and the only way to see the other person was if they sent you their picture via email. Smartphones weren't invented yet, and there definitely wasn't a Tinder to swipe away all notions of romance and propriety. <laughs> AOL was a great equalizer for someone like me because I had a face made for chat rooms. <laughs> I could woo women with words hiding behind a computer screen without them knowing what I looked like. We had screen names to further detach ourselves from reality. So it was in this cesspool of internet love where I, AKA Crow 85, <laughs> met a woman, Aimster 234. Her real name is Amy, and at the time she was 18 years old, a freshman in college, and majored in athletic training. We spent all night chatting on the computer, and I spent all day thinking about spending all night chatting on the computer <laughs> with Aimster 234. And after she felt comfortable that I wasn't one of those dudes on datelines to catch a predator, <laughs> we decided to meet in person for lunch. This connection came at a relatively low point in my life. I was 24, recently graduated from college, and still living at home. I didn't make any meaningful friendships in college. And I was, when I wasn't in class, I was waking up at 4 in the morning delivering newspapers for the San, U San Diego Union Tribune. So the only relationships I developed were with customers who refused to pay their monthly bill. <laughs> I failed to get into medical school and grew tired of delivering newspapers for deadbeats. About the only thing a bachelor's degree in animal physiology qualified me for was a job as an EMT for, four, uh, for seven bucks an hour and a gig as a night clerk at 7-Eleven. If you understand anything about Asian parents, is that I felt more shame living at home with a worthless college degree than working the graveyard shift at 7-Eleven slinging Hustler magazines and Marlboro lights for drunks at one in the morning. My only real friend at the time was Fook. We met in elementary school and became close in high school. He was Vietnamese too, and our idea was of fun was betting on football and supporting Native Americans by playing Pai Gal at Qu Saquon Casino. <laughs> And about the only thing we enjoyed more than gambling was to daydream about how one day we were going to be rich. We envied the only rich Vietnamese guy we knew. His name was Tom Vu, and we saw him on late night TV infomercials hawking get rich quick schemes. His motto was, you deserve to be broke. I can make you rich. He was the OG of celebrity scam artists the ringleader of a burgeoning self-improvement circus before the likes of Tony Robbins and Trump University. <laughs> his videos, in his videos, he was often pictured on a yacht surrounded by beautiful bikini-clad women. Sadly, that was about as close as we had ever gotten to an attractive woman. <laughs> You'd think that two dudes named Hung and Fuck would be better with the ladies. <laughs> So naturally, our solution was to change our names to Jay and Brent. Because what could be more white? <laughs> to understand this kind of pathology, we have to travel back in time. I was seven years old when our family emigrated from Vietnam to America. In school, white kids had clothes that fit. Metal Spider-Man lunchboxes and they spoke a language, a secret language, that only they could understand. 
Meanwhile, kids like me and Fook waited in line with white paper and lunch cards, which entitled us to free meals, while the lady at the register punched a hole in the card. I should have been grateful, but for a child, shame smothers gratitude in its sleep. The differences were all around us. On weekends, my siblings and I helped my parents clean white people's homes in rich neighborhoods. Homes with white carpets and wood floors. Everyone had their own bedrooms, and even their pets had beds. My brother and I slept on the couch in the living room in a home infested with rats. Homeless people slept in our basement. And when my mom took me to the supermarket, we paid for our groceries with food, st with food stamps and coupons clipped from the Sunday paper. So in my binary view of the world, <coughs> Vietnamese people like us were poor and white people were rich. So of course I wanted very much to be white and rejected everything that was Asian. I found every excuse not to go to the store with my mom. I wore the white lunch card like the scarlet letter and eventually trashed the card and, forgets and went through school without eating lunch at all. Forget Fen Fen. All you need is a healthy dose of pride to lose that last 15 pounds. <laughs> During college, I drove a hand-me-down Nissan that could not go in reverse. <laughs> so I saved up enough money with my two jobs for an upgrade. While all the other Asian kids drove Toyotas and Hondas, I shocked my parents by buying something unconventional. What says white Anglo-Saxon more than a German-engineered Wolfsburg Limited Edition Volkswagen Jetta. <laughs> and to top it all off, I completed my wannabe white boy makeover by bleaching my hair blonde. <laughs> so meeting Aimster 234, even if it was just in a chat room, felt like real progress. On the day that we were to meet in person for the first time, I emptied a spray can of Aquanet in my spiky blonde hair, <laughs> and the Jetta got a wash and a turtle wax. I drove to a campus in Point Loma to pick her up. When she walked out of that dormitory with a smile so infectious that could make COVID jealous, I felt that kind of euphoria you feel after you've labored over a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle, and that last piece falls into place. Now, I wish I could say the same about her first impression of me. <laughs> While I was waiting outside of her dorm, standing next to my VW Jetta with spiky bleach blonde hair, she was looking out the window wondering why her date was so late. I guess in our nightly chat sessions, I forgot to tell her I was Asian. <laughs> it says something about a woman who takes a leap of faith and jumps into a car with the guy who had the worst case of imposter syndrome. I wasn't completely disingenuous. I didn't take her to a pizza place or a burger joint for lunch. No, I took her to the best that Asian culture had to offer, dim sum. Yeah. Yes. Never mind that dim sum is Chinese and not Vietnamese. What difference did two countries separated by language, culture, and a deep history of hatred for one another make anyway? <laughs> when we walked into an Emerald restaurant, all the servers and customers stared at us. I felt like Travis Kelsey entering a nightclub with Taylor Swift. When we weren't fumbling around with our chopsticks, she talked about growing up with two teachers who were strict Christian conservatives. And in an act of rebellion, she got a belly button ring. <laughs> we must have been drunk on jasmine tea and pork dumplings because for some inexplicable reason, I ordered chicken feet. <laughs> now I could make the argument that if this relationship was gonna go anywhere, what better preparation for a white woman to deal with an Asian mother-in-law than a big heaping plate of chicken feet. <laughs> now, if you haven't tried it, close your eyes, take a few deep cleansing breaths, and imagine chewing a mouthful of gelatinous metal screws bathed in a sweet and savory ginger sauce. <laughs> 
to her credit, she tried it. She didn't pretend to like it. And in her defense, the cook forgot to pluck a few feathers. <laughs> when we finished dim sum, I drove her back to campus. I didn't know it at the time, but after I dropped her off, she wrote a letter to her mom declaring that she had met the man she was going to marry. I wasn't that presumptuous <laughs> on the drive back home. My only thought was, how was I going to convince her to show me that belly button ring? <laughs> it might seem strange that while it took me years to accept who I am, a stranger I met over the internet accepted me over dim sum and chicken feet. <laughs> At my lowest point, with dreams of medical school fading, Aimster234, who hailed from a white Christian conservative family, took a chance on AKA Crow85, <laughs> a Vietnamese guy who tried really hard to be someone else. While I was trying to break out of my culture like it was some prison with four walls to which I was confined, she saw culture as a grand buffet table where all the world's culture sat on carefully crafted dishes for all to share and enjoy. It didn't take her long to embrace Vietnamese culture. She was slurping pho and devouring banh mi faster than you can say Ho Chi Minh. <laughs> it also didn't take her long to do something else. On our second date, inside my Volkswagen Jetta, <laughs> in a parking lot overlooking Coronado Bridge, <laughs> under a blanket of shimmering stars, <laughs> she showed me her belly button ring. <laughs> Fast forward 10 years later, in a cozy cabin in the mountains of Asheville, North Carolina, I showed her an engagement ring. Tom Vu turned into a degenerate gambler. AK Crow became the richest man in the world. Thank you. Jay Vu, ladies and gentlemen, Jay Vu.